All right, well, I want to begin, just as I mentioned in prayer, I want to begin a new study tonight. As you have the handout, I want to begin a study on evangelism. It's been on my heart for some time, and um, we almost, as a session, we almost arranged for a sort of mini-conference on evangelism um, uh, earlier this year, but uh, it didn't come together, and so then we uh, thought a little further ahead, and so now the plan is to host a Reformed conference uh, November next year. Eric Watkins, if you're familiar with that name, fam a familiar name in the OPC, used to be a pastor in Florida, now a pastor in California, and uh, well known for his evangelistic efforts. And so right now we've scheduled Eric Watkins to be our speaker for the November conference in 2025, and he's going to be doing a conference on evangelism. So this has been something that's been on my heart, on the session's heart, and so I want to take us to this study, and I pray that the Lord will use it to encourage us, because this is not something that we do well anyway as, uh, as Christians, as believers, but this is particularly an area, I think, in which the Reformed Church can struggle, um, especially in some of the uh, more narrow aspects of the Reformed Church that ventures into even hyper-Calvinism, in which you believe that evangelism is unnecessary because God is elected and God's going to save, so there's no need to evangelize, so they don't do any at all. But it can be the, it can be the, the weakness of Reformed circles uh, that we become so focused on, and we should be focused upon, right doctrine, right teaching, and strengthening the church with good theological and instruction and guidance in faith and practice, <coughs> that we don't evangelize well, that we don't reach out, that we don't, uh, we don't remember well that the gospel begins with sharing Jesus and speaking to others and bringing them in to the, to the people of God. And so I think the study is something that uh, would be good for us and be helpful for us. I have in my, my mind eventually this book, maybe in a few weeks, uh, w William Metzger. Um, this is a book called Tell the Truth, the Whole Gospel to the Whole Person, Holy by Grace, by Whole People. And that, those are the four sections of the book. Um, I taught through this book as an elder in the PCA almost 30 years ago. This is the revised edition. Uh, it's expanded. There's a study, a study guide. There's appendices in the back. There's several extra helps in this. Really, really great a training manual on the message and methods of God-centered witnessing. Uh, you may think of uh, immediately uh, J.I. Packer's book may come to your mind, right? Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, very famous book on evangelism, especially in Reformed circles. Well, Packer highly recommends this book, as do uh, many others. It's a really great read, very helpful, and very practical. Uh, so uh, I have this in my, again, in my eye to look forward to that, to work toward that. But before we dig into Metzger's book, I think it's important to lay a few foundations, a foundational considerations, because uh, we do come from a reform perspective, which is not our weakness, it is our strength. Unfortunately, in practice, it tends to be a weakness because we don't, we don't do evangelism well, but that's not the fault of our theology at all. Our theology inflames, should inflame, ought to inflame our evangelism. A reform perspective is the greatest incentive to evangelize, uh, the greatest help toward evangelism, the greatest uh, uh, assurance and guarantee of success in evangelism is God has elected a people, and he has sent his spirit, indeed, with irresistible grace, to call with irresistible grace, and to bring them into the church. So the five points of Calvinism in particular is not uh, a hindrance, it's not a, a weakness, it's a strength. Um, so we need to keep that in mind, and hopefully that will empower and enable us. So I want to start tonight with a bit of a definition, kind of an extended definition. What is evangelism? And then you look on the back side, uh, really 15 presuppositions. These have a bit of an order. I hope the order makes sense. At least in my mind, they're ordered um, and grouped a little bit. Uh, one flows to the next, and kind of laying some groundwork. 15 presuppositions in our evangelism of the gospel of God's grace to sinners in Jesus Christ. And you'll notice as we go through these, these are reformed presuppositions, right? We, we all have presuppositions. Even the non-reformed have presuppositions. You can't avoid presuppositions. What we need to be sure is that our presuppositions are biblical, right? Not simply theological because that's our theology, but rather biblical because that's what God says. And so I've laid these out for us and we'll walk through those and look up some of those key verses. A quote from Packer's book at the top there, always and everywhere the servants of Christ are under orders to evangelize. So evangelism is the task of the church, right? Maybe primarily the task of ministers, the task of even the OPC has a, has a call of evangelist, right? You can be a minister of the gospel, you can be an elder, or you can be an evangelist, right? Kind of a church planter. So there's actually a particular office for that. Uh, but we don't want to fall into the habit of thinking, well, that's his job. He does the evangelizing. Let's call an evangelist in, right? 
Rather, we all should be evangelizing and going forth. Now, when you read the New Testament, and Lord willing, next Sunday, with God's help, I'm going to begin preaching uh, through the book of Acts. And we're going to look at the apostles as evangelists, and we'll look at the Great Commission. And it's important to understand that the Great Commission carries you know, the majority of its weight for the apostles, right? The apostles are the ones who were sent forth. And particularly when you come to Acts, Jesus says to the apostles, you are my witnesses. Christ is saying to them, you are my evangelist, right? You are going to go forth. And that's exactly what we see in the book of Acts. But it's the burden of us all to share the gospel, even as we see with the woman at the well that was so successful with such a simple and short message. All right, so what is evangelism? So I'm just going to read a lot of this as we begin, and then we'll move into the presuppositions. The first thing we need to recognize is that there's a failure in that we think of evangelism as, uh, or we emphasize in evangelism, conversion, right? Go out, preach Jesus, share Jesus, get someone to be saved, and then we bring them into the church, and then we sit them down, this is your seat, and then we just move on. In other words, we need to realize that evangelism carries an ongoing responsibility, an ongoing responsibility, and that's discipleship. Right? You can't evangelize. You can't get the whole gospel in an evangelistic message. You can't get the whole gospel on a street corner. You can't get the whole Bible on a street corner, but you can share the gospel to them in such a way that they can come to Christ by faith, by his grace, and then bring them into the church and disciple them, continue to instruct them and build them up in the faith, teach them how to be good men, good women, good fathers, good mothers, good children, good parents, good employees, employers, citizens, whatever it may be, good Christians, good church members, all the things that the Lord called, has called us to do. So the th well, first thing we need to recognize is given how many of the church's regular members have an inadequate knowledge of the gospel and an impoverished understanding of the Christian life, a considerable amount of the church's evangelistic efforts must aim at the instruction, edification, and discipleship of its current members. Now this I hope, at least my heart, and it's been my passion as your pastor, this I hope the OPC does well, to instruct, to teach, to build up, to strengthen the church. Ephesians 4. Right? We do that well. We disciple as a church. I disciple as I teach. I disciple as I preach. I instruct in that way that we might be built up in our faith. That's my goal and passion. But we need to recognize that that's the, the extent of evangelism. And only so much discipleship can be done by the pastor from the pulpit. Right? Even in three services on a Sunday, only so much can be done. What needs to be done is as Titus, Paul tells Titus, Older men bringing young men under their wing. Older women bringing younger women under their wing. Teaching, training, catechizing, walking beside, praying with, helping, listening to. We need to guide and disciple in those ways. So first of all, then, one of the sad byproducts of zealous outreach to the unsaved and a narrow focus on the conversion of the lost is the neglect of this ongoing discipleship. Right? People are brought in and expected to catch up and keep up without the time taken to disciple them. Think about this. And I thought about this when I, th when I um, considered starting this study. I thought, wow, what would happen, Lord, if we all of a sudden, by your grace, got evangelistic in our efforts and we had 15 new people come to the church? 15 new people convert to the Lord Jesus Christ, genuine conversions, new to the faith. They, hear and they're filled, they fill our pews, 15 people. Then what? If we're not careful, what we would do is greet them every Sunday morning and leave every Sunday afternoon and say, see you next week. What's going to happen to them? Again, only so much can be done by the pastor from the pulpit three times a Sunday. Only so much. Right? Will anyone call them? Will anyone say, I'd love to walk you through that. Have you heard of the Shorter Catechism? Likely not. I'd love to walk you through the Shorter Catechism. Let's get together for lunch, coffee, breakfast, anything. Right? You see what, you see what happens? There's a consequence to evangelizing. As God brings new people in, the church that is evangelistic needs to be ready to disciple. Otherwise, what happens to those people? Right? They might just drop right off. So we need to realize the importance. Now, the number one and the primary means of discipleship is the ministry of the word. It is the means of grace. But that doesn't annul or take away the ongoing discipleship that Paul describes that should happen among us as members. So Titus 2, remember what Paul says here. To this young minister of the gospel in regards to the life of the church. Titus 2, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. 
They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Notice that, that the word of God may not be reviled. People need to be taught how to live godly lives as godly people. And it breaks it right down even to the, even to the domestic responsibilities, right at the home, right? Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. That's what it's about, adorning the doctrine we believe by a godly life. So the, our faith our theology is to be adorned by praxology, how we live. And then turn to 2 Timothy 2. Paul speaks there to the women particularly with regard to their responsibility, older women to younger women. But 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, And you, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Faith is to be passed on. It is to be instru- we are to instruct others so that the faith continues and it continues from one generation to the other. So the church's evangelism, number two, must therefore include bringing the gospel in its full import, its demands, its comforts to the believers in the church who may yet be hindered in their growth by ignorance, unfaithfulness, or compromising situations, right? They just don't know. They haven't heard. They haven't been taught. No one's ever told them. So bringing them in, and particularly when they come into into a church setting in which we're teaching through some series, even the couple of couple of nights ago, we had visitors uh, that visited, and they were here on a Sunday night, and I spoke to them beforehand. I said, bear with me. I'm on lesson 15. <laughs> you missed 14 lessons, right? There's a lot going on. There's a lot of assumptions I can make because we're on lesson 15 as a church. Right? You've missed all of that. I can't recover that ground, um, but just keep the notes before you and let's work through this. Right. So that was the encouragement I gave them because that's the situation they're coming into. Or, for instance, think of our summer visitors. They come in and I'm on Hosea chapter 12. Right? I'm making a lot of assumptions. This morning I made a lot of assumptions when we looked at the 14th chapter. I don't have to cover certain things because we've already talked about that as a congregation. Right? So visitors miss out on that, but my burden is the congregation and the sheep the Lord's given me. So I can make assumptions. We've been walking through this together, and that helps me in a given passage to narrow my focus and to assume the found, upon the foundation that's been laid. That's the beauty of a, of a life and a community and a church together and walking in the faith together. We can start something on a lesson one, and we can get to lesson 20, and we've all gotten there together, right? And we're all growing together. But what happens when someone new comes in? They're going to need to be brought up, right? And we shouldn't expect them to catch up on their own, or we shouldn't assume that they know what we know, especially if we've grown up in the faith and grown up in the church where they may not have. So, again, with evangelism, it's a great privilege to be an instrument in God's hand to share the gospel. But remember the responsibility that comes with it. Responsibility to you as you speak to someone and they come and sit next to you, but the responsibility that it brings to the church as well, right? Especially if someone comes with a family, you're expecting the Sunday school teacher to welcome three new kids, all of a sudden, right? So it comes without an obligation, and this is a great privilege to be useful in the Lord's hands for the gospel to go forth. Now, letter B, the word evangelism, as you know, comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means good message or good news. So to evangelize is to set forth the good news of God. It's God's news, and it's good because we need it desperately, okay? Packer says, it's a work of communication, in which Christians make themselves mouthpieces for God's message of mercy to sinners. That's what evangelism is. There's a lot of different ways to, to define the term, depending on what your agenda is and how, what you want to actually um, emphasize. Uh, but there's several here that I think they're helpful. It's a work of communication. It means we're communicating. We're using our mouths to evangelize. In which Christians make themselves mouthpieces for God's message of mercy to sinners. Letter C, evangelism is the propagation of the gospel of salvation in Christ to the unsaved. Now, that's more narrowly defined, right? As we said in the opening point, that evangelistic task of the church extends not just to the unsaved, but when they come in in the church, it extends to them as the saved, right? It, It moves to discipleship, mentoring, right? But more narrowly, it's the propagation of the gospel of salvation to the unsaved. 
And so it finds its climax in a plea from the Creator to a rebel world to turn and put faith in Christ. And therefore it involves the summoning of one's hearers to conversion. It involves the summoning of your hearers to repentance, to repent and believe the gospel. Evangelism reaches a a climax, right? We haven't evangelized if we don't share Christ, but we haven't evangelized if we don't reach at some point the call to believe, right? The call to repent, the plea from the creator to a rebel world that they put faith in Christ and they believe the message in order to be reconciled to God before his judgment comes. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5. Paul talks about evangelism very clearly here <coughs> under the, what he calls the message of reconciliation. That's what evangelism is. It's a message of reconciliation. In fact, it's God's message of reconciliation because it's God not only who sends out ministers as ambassadors, and here he's talking more narrowly about ministers because of uh, his defense of himself as an apostle and the other apostles, but all of us who are sent out, he sends us out with a message of reconciliation. So first, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, to, sorry. Uh, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So there's a judgment day coming, says Paul. Therefore, verse 11, knowing the fear of the Lord, right, We persuade others, knowing that judgment day is coming. What do we do? We go out into the world with the gospel, the good news, the message of reconciliation. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not committing ourselves to you again by giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, and if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died, Christ, has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. The new creation is what it says in the text, actually. New creation has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. You see, God's making the appeal. We're just a mouthpiece. God is the one calling sinners to repentance. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see the the appeal? That's an evangelistic message right there. Paul says God has given us the message, the ministry, the burden of reconciliation. It's his message, and the burden is upon us to be the mouthpiece, but he's the one making the appeal. He's the one calling sinners to repentance, because he is the one who will judge them if they don't, and who will be reconciled to them if they do. And so it reminds us then uh, also of Acts 17. Turn there, another text to keep sort of as a peg to hang things on, Acts 17. 30 to 31, Paul here at Mars Hill. This is the text in which Paul is evangelizing, right, at the Areopagus to the Gentiles, to the Greeks. Verse 30 and 31, Paul says, The times of ignorance, speaking of the Old Testament now, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, And of this he has given assurance to all by raising that man from the dead. So he has appointed a day in which Christ will judge the world. And he's assured us that that day is coming by raising that man from the dead in order that he might take his seat on the throne and judge. So God is appealing to the creation because judgment is coming. He's appealing to be reconciled to him before it is too late. Now letter D, and again I'm just running through some some, uh, basics here. Letter D, a study of the New Testament, and in particular, the evangelism efforts of the apostles in the book of Acts. 
reveals that there was no fixed form in which the gospel was presented. Now, these days, we have things like the Romans Road, right? We have other means to be able to walk through the basics of an evangelistic uh, message to someone. These can all be helpful. But when you look at the book of Acts, right, what we realize is there's no fixed form that continued to be repeated. And that's important because we can fall into the trap of a fixed form. But what we learn from the book of Acts, in each case, the necessary content of the gospel, and the gospel has necessary content, right? There's certain things you need to bring forth, you need to bring to light. The necessary content was set forth in a manner sensitive to and aimed at the specific situation and circumstance. So in each case, it's it's the gospel that we're presenting. And in each case, it was the gospel that was presented. However, the content was never modified, but it was preached with a sensitivity to the persons and the situation. In the comparison, you can easily see that by comparing Acts chapter 17 and Acts chapter 2. So here we have 17 before us. You look at Acts 17... Paul is preaching the Oropagus there, beginning in verse 22. Men of Athens, <clears throat> you know the story. I perceive that in every way you are very religious. All these altars, one to the unknown God. That's the God I declare to you, because he is none of these idols, right? I declare to you that God, and he preaches the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you read through that, just to the end of the chapter, this obviously isn't Paul's whole sermon, right? Luke truncated and gave us a summary. So it isn't the whole sermon, but if you just look through that, you notice Paul doesn't quote the Old Testament. Why? Because they're men of Athens. (laughs) They're Greeks, they're Gentiles. Now, is the Old Testament, does the Old Testament have bearing? Of course it does, right? For Paul, that's the only Bible there is, right? The New Testament isn't written yet. So that is the Bible, and Paul preached regularly from the Old Testament. But in this case, that message, right, bringing that, highlighting that would not make any sense. It's not that he left the Word of God out, but the point is his approach takes into account his audience, And what does he preach? The gospel. But then go to Acts chapter 2. And Peter, of course, preaching here to Jews, now from all over the world, right? They've come for for the day of Pentecost. So they've come from all over the world, gathered from all these nations, but they're Jews. Men of Israel, he calls them in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. And what does he begin in verse 16? He begins by quoting from Joel chapter 2, right? And then he moves to the Psalms. Psalm 16, Psalm 2, right? He's quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting their scriptures, which they know, which they hear read in the synagogue every single Sabbath. In fact, they've memorized probably, right? He's preaching to Jews. And so what we see through the book of Acts is that the content of the gospel was preached with a sensitivity to one's audience and one's context. Evangelism then, look at number one. Evangelism is not to be an impersonal, canned message robotically rattled off in hopes of finding a buyer. doesn't mean you can't use the Romans Road. The Romans Road, things like that, they're great. But it isn't supposed to be this sort of canned message that we're hoping to sell and pitch to someone. And then when they buy it, we just put a notch in our belt and move on to the next person. That's not what evangelism is, right? Evangelism, rather, is to be a personal message to persons we love and care about for the honor of the Christ we proclaim, right? Packer, at the end of his book, if you've read it, Evangelism and Sovereignty of God, at the end of his book, he talks about friendship evangelism. It's not a large section, but he talks about building a relationship with people so that, as he, I, these are the words that at least are in my memory from 30 years ago. <laughs> I don't know if these are exact words he uses, uh, but in a sense where you earn the right to speak into their life about serious matters, right? You earn the right, in a sense, to be able to speak to them about their soul, right? It's not always helpful to walk up to everybody and say to a total stranger, hey, do you know Jesus? You can start that way, right? Of course you can start that way. But the reality, I think what Packer was was getting at, which is why it struck me and stuck with me all these years, is it's about a relationship, right? It's about a personal message to persons we love and care about. We're sharing the most important person to us, Jesus. We're telling people about Jesus, And we're telling them about Jesus because we care about them. We care about their soul. We're not just looking to, to, you know, uh, for the next conversion, right? I know in my circles, maybe your previous circles, I grew up with people asking me all the time, how many people have you saved, right? How many people have you converted? How many people have you brought to Jesus Christ, right? And I don't mean that anyone boasted about that in the wrong way necessarily, but that was kind of the thought, right? You just kind of keep track, and I've saved so many people. I brought 
what happens is, what can happen in those situations, it becomes as this impersonal canned message. You're just looking for a buyer. You don't sell the gospel. It's not a pitch or a spiel. We're sharing Jesus Christ, whom we love dearly, the Lord of lords. We proclaim Christ, and we're sharing him because they need Jesus. And we're just looking for a slight, the smallest open door, just to share Christ. Maybe that begins with inviting the church. Maybe that begins with a cup of coffee, inviting them over for dinner, something in order to have a relationship to show that you're coming from the place of sincerity, right? Because we live in a world in which everything is marketed, right? Everything is marketed. We're all afraid that somebody's trying to sell us something. And so people's initial reaction, we began to talk about the gospel as we're trying to sell something to them. So they have this resistance. We need to, we need to appreciate that. And we need to be careful that we don't come across in a way that we're trying to sell something. We're trying to market. You can't market Jesus. You don't market the gospel, right? You can't run the church like a business or a marketing campaign. A lot of churches do that, right? They bring in a marketing specialist. How can we become better marketed as a church? How can our message be marketed and advertised more catchy fashion? You don't do that with the gospel. You don't share the gospel that way. That's not how Christ is to be offered to sinners. Lastly here, as a bit of an intro, evangelism, we need to remember, is our work, but the giving of faith is God's, right? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, faith is God's gift, right? Faith is God's gift. So we have to remember that because we can fall into the, into the, um, into the place of thinking that, that we're supposed to convert someone. And if we, if we didn't convert someone, if someone didn't accept the message and, that we offered, didn't respond in faith to Christ, we feel that, that we failed, that, are, that we're, we're a terrible evangelist, right? I've never saved anyone, right? I'm a failure. You know, I stopped trying, right? We need to realize that it's God that gives the faith. It's God that, as we heard this morning from Hosea, it's God who gives repentance. It's a gift. His spirit has to work it in, right? And so what that means further is that our evangelism is, evangelism is not to be measured by its results, right? Evangelism is not to be measured by its results. If it is, then Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, Joel, they were all terrible evangelists. They had no good results, right? Jeremiah had no converts in 40 years of ministry, right? For as far as we know, neither did Isaiah. Crying out, crying out, crying out, and nobody would listen. So we don't measure evangelism by its results. Instead, we measure evangelism by its faithfulness. Faithfulness to what? To the standard, right? To the scriptures, it's faithfulness to present the truth of the gospel as God has revealed them in his word. So what we want to be is not simply evangelists or witnesses. We want to be biblical in it, which is why we have all these presuppositions on the back, right? What biblical foundations or presuppositions govern and undergird our evangelistic efforts? We want to be faithful to that. And if we're faithful to that, then all is well, right? All is well. So our encouragement in evangelism cannot be conditioned upon the results, but only upon whether we honored and glorified the Christ we proclaim which we secure that by, being, by our motivation in the work and our faithfulness to it. Are we seeking God's glory, and are we faithful to the word in our evangelism? Then we've done well, right? I remember one time years ago, um, just when I came, actually soon after I came to Reformed Faith, a friend of mine, we would, we would go out every Saturday and we would evangelize, right? Door to door, go in parking lots, and I remember we came back after a couple of hours, and he had had... I don't know, two or three really good responses. And I had had none. <laughs> and he was all joyful. And I said, what are you so happy about? <laughs> I was so mad. It was a terrible thing, but I was so mad because he had been successful and I had not. In my mind, I wasn't successful, right? And I got mad at him for being happy about the success that he had found that he had responses, right? They, had said, they accepted the tract and all was well, and everybody rejected me and shut the door in my face. And I thought, oh, I was a failure. But I wasn't really, was I? Right? If I had shared the gospel well, which I did by God's grace, I hope, then I was just as successful. But it pleased the Lord that he was brought maybe to water a seed already planted, right, or harvest a seed, whereas I may have planted and not known it, or maybe I was used by the Lord to harden the hardened. I don't know. Right? But my faithfulness, I was measuring my faithfulness by my success compared to his, or lack of success compared to his success, and I thought I was a failure. That's the wrong way to go about it. All right, secondly then, let's look at these presuppositions. There's a lot here. You're going to wind up looking up most of these verses. But I want to walk through these. And again, there's a bit of an order, I hope. 
by which we can just trace what we understand as the Bible proclaims these things to us. So first of all, turn to 2 Corinthians 4. The first presupposition, right? Presuppositions ground your methodology, right? The theological groundings and underpinnings for your methodology, they ground what we believe, they ground what we do, our faith and practice. They undergird everything. So 2 Corinthians 4. So the first presupposition is that God's glory is our chief end and aim in evangelism. We're looking to glorify God. Again, we're not aimed at, we'd love success, we would love to be successful, right? In, a, in sort of a, um, in a human term, right? And have responses, favorable responses. But what we're really aiming out above all else is God's glory as our chief end. So 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of Christ. I love that, right? That's really, the, that's really what the message uh, of the gospel is. It is the light of the, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Beautiful. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when we present Christ, when we, pre, when we hold forth the face of Christ, right, we're bringing the glory of God to bear. Because the glory of God shines in the face of Jesus Christ. And the message of Christ, when the message of Christ is preached, we're proclaiming the glory of God because God has seen fit. It pleases the Father to exalt the Son. It pleased the Trinity that the Son would take on flesh for all eternity and that the Son would be visible to the human eye for all eternity. It glorifies God. God's glory shines in the face of Christ. And so we seek the glory of God in our evangelism. Secondly, the Bible, of course, is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. This is our catechism. And that means the Bible is the only infallible revelation of what we're to believe and how we're to live, as the catechism says. But that further means that the, the Bible is the only infallible rule for both the method, the means, and the message of evangelize, right? What is evangelism? What does it look like? How do you do it? What are the method, means, and message? Let the Bible tell us. The Bible governs our evangelism. We don't evangelize outside of the Bible because it's the, the Bible that we're ministering with, right? That's the message arises from Scripture itself. So further then, we don't evangelize with the philosophies of human wisdom, or with the fallacies of a man-centered message which proclaims a Jesus who came to make you healthy, wealthy, and happy. Instead, we preach the gospel of salvation, right? God's message of mercy, right? Remember what Paul called it? A message of reconciliation. That has a lot of assumptions. That carries a lot of freight, right? That means you're a sinner, and you need to be reconciled. You're apart from God, and you need to be reconciled to God. And what's, what, Paul, what did Paul say moved him? Knowing that there is a judgment coming. And knowing that God has shown his love to us in Christ, we're motivated by this. Look at 1 Corinthians 2. Paul says very particularly here to the Corinthians who boasted in wisdom and philosophy. Right? Paul was stood against this and opposed this. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Because as he had already said in chapter 1, the wisdom of men is foolishness in the eyes of God. Right? God, is, God has decreed that no man will find him by wisdom, earthly wisdom. You can't reason your way to God. And this is why the theological proofs right, of God are great apologetically, but they're not the best tools of evangelism because they just present a creator, a God. Right? They argue for a deity. The theological proofs of God's existence are powerful proofs, always have been, but they argue for the existence of a deity. If there's a watch, there's a watchmaker. But now somehow you've got, to do, you've got to convince them that that watchmaker is actually the God of the Bible. But you've not done that by your argument. Your argument has just said there's a watchmaker. 
there's a creation, there's a creator. Well, who is he? Well, it's the God of the Bible. You're assuming that, right? That's why we don't reason from theological proofs. We reason from Scripture, God's self-revelation. God's word declares God, brings God forth. You're bringing God into the equation when you preach and present the message of Scripture. Third presupposition. Man is a parent. Now, these next three will be about man. Man is a perishing sinner in need of Christ as Savior. That's right from Romans 1, 16 to 32, right? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, Romans 1, 18, right? Man is a sinner. He's perishing. He needs Christ, and if he doesn't find Christ, he's going to die and go to hell. So this creates two things here, both a necessity and an urgency in the evangelistic task. If we don't go forth with the gospel, right? Remember, well, actually, just turn to Romans 10, Romans 10, verse 13. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. What a great promise. However, keep going. But how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And then he goes step by step, doesn't he? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless someone is sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for as Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Right? So everyone who calls by the name of the Lord will be saved. But in order for them to call, they've got to believe. In order to believe, they've got to hear. In order to hear, they've got to be sent. And if someone is sent, they've got to go with the message of the gospel because it's only by that gospel that faith can be engendered. Faith can be brought into the heart, right? Because that's what the Spirit uses, the Word of God. And so this creates a necessity and an urgency in the evangelistic task. No man can be saved without the gospel. And as long as he stands outside of it, he is hastening to eternal perdition. You will perish. Christ said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you the truth, unless you repent, you will perish. So man is perishing. He needs Christ. Letter D. Man is fully responsible for his fallenness, his sinfulness, his rebellion, his enmity against God, his sins. And therefore, he is responsible and accountable before God to repent of his rebellion and return to God in hope of mercy. Turn to Ezekiel 18. I recommend the whole chapter to you. But it ends on this appeal that God makes. Really an evangelistic appeal to Israel. Ezekiel 18, verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Think of Hosea 14 this morning. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord, so turn and live. Right? It was the Puritans arising from that text, using that text. It was the Puritans who started the phrase, turn or burn. Right? That's not a charismatic phrase, right? A charismatic church. Turn or burn. I grew up with it, but where did it come from? It comes from Ezekiel 18. It's the Lord that says, turn and live. Why will you perish? Right? Turn and live. So man is fully responsible. Man is responsible and accountable before God for his rebellion, for his sins, for his enmity. And he is responsible to return. God commands him to return. We've already read Acts 18, turn to Isaiah chapter 1 while we're here in the major prophets. Isaiah chapter 1, remember the Lord's words in verses 18 to 20. You have God's gracious offer of pardon, but then God's warning to those who refuse. Verse 18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land, Hosea 14. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. You're responsible, right? I'm calling you, 
And if you come, I will bless you. But if you refuse to come, you're responsible for your refusal. You're responsible for your rejection of the gospel that is brought to you. Letter E, man is totally depraved. Man is totally depraved in heart, mind, and will. Man is in need of God's grace to repent and believe because he's unable to do so of himself. So here we have this bit of a conundrum, don't we? Man is fully responsible to repent and believe, but he has so fallen in his sinfulness that he can't repent or believe. He stands in need of grace to do so. And again, that's why I brought that, that point out this morning. God calls the elect in Israel to repent, but it's the Holy Spirit who goes out to enable that repentance. Otherwise, they can never come. They're just like their brothers and sisters, just like their brethren. So man is totally depraved. He is in need of the grace of God to repent and believe. Turn to John 1. I'm trying to just look up a minimal number of these verses so that we can get through tonight, but I want you to look up the rest as you'll find them encouraging on each of these points. John 1, you remember, verse 11 speaks of Christ. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Right? Did not believe in him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The right was given. It's a gift. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Right? To be brought to God is the work of God. So you have these twin notions. Go back to letter E. These twin notions of total inability and total responsibility. These are the two concerns, right? You're totally unable and you're totally responsible because your inability is your own fault. Right? We all know that. Our inability is our fault. It's the fault of our fallenness, the fault of our rebellion. So these twin notions must be pressed into the souls of hearers because they must be brought to despair of any self-righteousness. And they must be brought to a total trust in Christ for righteousness with, righteousness with God. It must be driven outside of themselves. Remember, this is what the law does, right? Think of what we've been learning in Sunday school, how the Holy Spirit brings our things home to us and then Christ's things home to us, right? It's the law that convinces and convicts us that we're totally helpless. But the gospel doesn't stop there. So the law convicts and condemns and shows us our helplessness, but then it brings help, Christ himself, the gospel. So this is man's condition. He's a perishing sinner. He's fully responsible for his fallenness, and his fallenness is so bad that he's totally depraved and can't come. He can't do anything to even contribute to his salvation. Totally unable, totally responsible for that inability. Letter F. We turn to God. Again, another set of presuppositions here about the Lord God. God has elected a people for salvation in Christ. God has elected a people for salvation in Christ. Out of the fallen mass of humanity, out of Adam's seed, God has elected a portion. We don't know how many. The majority, the minority, it doesn't matter. God has elected those whom it pleased him to elect. John 15, 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you, that you might bear fruit. And then in John 17, remember what Jesus says, I do not pray for these only. Actually, let me just read that really quickly. I think I'm thinking of verse 9. But in verse 6, John 17, Jesus says, I have manifested, praise to the Father, you remember, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world, right? God has given Christ a people from out of the world, the mass of fallen humanity. Yours they were. Why were they God's? Because he, remember, in terms of economy, the Father did the electing, not Jesus. So the Father elected them. Yours they were, but you gave them to me. To do what? To redeem. And that Christ gives them to the Spirit to apply that redemption. So yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. I am praying, verse 9, I am praying for them. Notice now verse 9, I am not praying for the world. What a stark statement. Christ makes clear that whatever the, however you define the world, Christ is not praying for them. But however you define the world, it's the opposite or the other side of those whom you have given me that I'm praying for. Right? And Christ's prayers are answered, and those whom were given to him for those he died and those who are saved. So it becomes very clear there is, an, a, there is an elect that are to be saved for whom Christ prays. There is the rest who are not to be saved for whom Christ does not pray. He is not their high priest. Right? Aaron wasn't making sacrifices for the Gentiles, but only for Israel. Right? And as he atoned... As he offered the sacrifices, Israel was atoned for. 
not the Philistines, not the Egyptians. They had their own priests, false priests they were, and therefore useless, but Aaron's ministry was directed to the Israelites. So Christ's ministry is to those, you give, to, uh, those whom you have given me, not the world, not the rest. Acts 13, 48. Probably take us five years to get there. You better look at it now. Acts 13, 48. There's a lot going on here. This is actually Paul's first message. You notice all the, the Old Testament quotes in your Bible. Paul's preaching at Antioch. He's preaching to Jews. Men of Israel, he says in verse 17, or verse 16. Then, of course, the Jews reject him. He turns to the Gentiles. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Shakes the dust from his feet. They're unworthy of eternal life. We're turning to the Gentiles, verse 46, because the Lord commanded us, again, the Old Testament, go to the Gentiles. If Christ has made a life of the Gentiles, then the message of Christ is to go to the Gentiles, and he turns to the Gentiles. Look at verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Right? Who believed? Those who were appointed to eternal life. The appointment to eternal life preceded their faith, preceded the preaching of the gospel, preceded their birth, because Ephesians 1.4 says it was before the foundation of the world. So you've got Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, many verses there. Romans 8.30, those whom he called, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified, the golden chain of salvation. So we begin with these presuppositions about God in letter F. God has elected a people for salvation. And again, that's not, in a hyper-Calvinistic sense, falsely so, that's a hindrance to evangelism. If God has elected, well, whatever God decrees to be done will be done, so let's just get out of the way and let God do it. But the God who elected, right, the God who, who set forth the end, decreed the end, also decreed the means to it. And the means to that salvation, as we'll see, is evangelism, right? The Lord sets forth the end and the means unto it, the whole thing. And so here, we, this is not rather a hindrance to evangelism. It's the greatest spur, right? God's election is the greatest encouragement. Remember, I think I told you before, Spurgeon said, if all of the elect had a yellow stripe down their backs, he would go around lifting shirts. Because if they're elect, then they're guaranteed to be saved. Maybe not by my message, but by a message yet to come to them. And therefore, we preach the gospel. God's election drives our evangelism. It impels us to evangelize. The second presupposition, letter G, God sent Christ to infallibly secure the salvation of his elect. Christ came to save the sheep. Very clearly. Remember what he said in John 17. I pray for these. I don't pray for those. These are the ones that were yours and you gave them to me. To do what? To give eternal life, right? If you go to John 17, verses 2 and 3, this is eternal life, right? He said, uh, verse 2, you have given him authority, that is the Son himself. You've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all the world, to all mankind, to every human being. No, to all those whom you have given him. Christ has been given the authority to give life, the saving life of God, to all the elect who are entrusted to him to redeem. And so God sent Christ to infallibly secure the salvation of the elect. God elected a people. Christ came to die for that people. It becomes very clear in John 6. Several texts, of course, but a good one is John 6, verses 37 to 40. All that the Father gives me, think of John 17 there, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing. It really should be no one, right? That I should lose no one of all those whom he has given me, but should raise them up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son, remember to look there means to believe, right? All those who look on the Son and believe in him, only the elect will do that. Everyone else hates him. That everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. It's the will of the Father that the elect come to salvation. How? By Christ. So therefore the Father sends Christ, and Christ sends the apostles, and through them ministers of the gospel to preach the gospel, and all of us to bear witness to the, the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And so God sent Christ to infallibly secure the salvation of those he elected. Letter H, 
God gives grace to his elect to come to Christ for salvation. I turn to Matthew 11. Now we left ourselves in a bit of a, a trouble in the presuppositions about man because he's, he's unable and he's responsible for his inability. So he's in a real situation, isn't he? Right? He's responsible for his inability and he's responsible for his unbelief and he's responsible for his rejection of the gospel, but he's so totally depraved he can't believe and he can't repent. But here's the good news. God has elected a people. And as our confession says, God gives his spirit to his elect <coughs> to enable them to believe. So Matthew 11, verses 25 to 27. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things, the things about Christ as the mediator and Savior. You've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. It's the will of God to hide it from some and to, and to, to uh, reveal it to others. And you look up above, right? Woe to the unrepentant cities. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Right? From them who Christ was, was hidden by the Father. All right? From the Pharisees, it was hidden. It did not please the Father to reveal Christ to Chorazin, to Bethsaida, right? And to Capernaum. But it pleased the Father to reveal Christ to the disciples. Let's say. And by His grace to you and I. This was God's gracious will. And then look at verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So God gives grace to come to Christ for salvation. Turn back to John 6, very important passage here. John 6. We're going to look at verses 44 and 45 and then 65. Verse 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then he gives an Old Testament text as a foundation for that. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. What did we just read in Matthew 11, right? If it pleases the Father to reveal Christ to someone, they will come to Christ. And to whom does it please the Father to reveal Christ? To his elect. Right? Because that revelation, as we saw this morning, that revelation is a drawing. Right? And so here Christ says that even as the Old Testament uh, declared, that people hear from the Father and they come to the Son. And no one can come to the Son unless the Father draws him. Then look at verse 65. Jesus says again something very similar. Right? This is why I told you that no one come, can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So even though man is responsible for his, his terrible situation, the beauty of the gospel is that God gives grace to his elect to come to Christ for salvation. And that means, fourthly, in the presuppositions about God, letter I, God is the sovereign primary mover in conversion and salvation. Right? God is the primary mover. It is God who opens the heart. It is God who brings to faith. It's God, those whom he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. You're not the primary mover. And we can fall into this thinking if I, if I pitch it just right, if I use just the right argument, if I use just the right scripture text, then they'll be sure to be persuaded. Right? You're not the primary mover in conversion. You can't make people be saved. You can't make people repent. God is the sovereign primary mover by his spirit, as we saw in Hosea 14, He's the one that goes forth. He's the one that can touch the heart, and he does. And he will. At the right time, every time at the right time, with his elect. Those are the ones he will turn and bring unto himself. The, other, the others God will harden. The same message, right? The same message will be the means of hardening them. That's why we read a passage in, in Exodus about how God hardened Pharaoh's heart. After Pharaoh hardened his heart, then we read God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Right? The very message of Moses that should have been converting uh, that could have been converting by God's grace, became the means of hardening Pharaoh. All right, well, we have some presuppositions and further about the Holy Spirit. Look at letter J, just three here, J, K, and L. First of all, the propagation of the gospel message is the means to the salvation of God's elect. So God has elected a people. He will give them faith to come to Christ, 
And the means to bring them to Christ is the gospel, because what does the gospel do? It presents Christ. It's the good news of Jesus Christ, right? And so uh, you think of Romans 1.16, right? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and salvation for all who believe, for the Jew first, or for the Greek, for the Jew first, and then also to the Greek. So the gospel is the means of salvation. God saves by the gospel. Go back to Romans 10, 17, right? How can they believe? 14, how can they believe unless someone is sent, right? But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ preached. So the propagation of the gospel message is the means to the salvation of God's elect. And that's why I said earlier, the election of a people by God is the compelling force of evangelism. It sends us forth to preach the gospel because we know God has an elect. He has a people that he is saving, and therefore we are to bring the gospel to them. Furthermore, letter K, God gives his spirit to his elect at the ordained time to enable them to believe and be saved. Right? To enable them to believe and be saved. Turn back to Acts. Turn to 16. We already read 1348. Those who were ordained, ordained to eternal life believed. Well, look at what happens very subtly, but a powerful testimony with the conversion of Lydia in Acts 16. Acts 16, verse 14. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Right? The Lord opened her heart to hear what was said. The Lord has to do it. He's the primary mover in conversion. But the great thing is, the ones he has ordained to save, he gave them to Christ to be saved, he gave them to the Spirit to save. Right? The Spirit does the work. He sends his Spirit out. This is the beauty. Of how does the Spirit, This is why we talk about the Spirit and the Word going together. Right? The Word and the Spirit go together. We preach the Word confident that the Spirit will go with the Word. Right? And as Paul says, to harden some, to soften others. But to the elect, he always goes with good, to do good, to save or to comfort or to encourage, whatever it may be. Um, Psalm 110, verse 3, right? The Lord makes us willing in his day of power. Think of the Sunday school, right? Coming home to our hearts, right? In the day of God's power, when God comes to save, we talked about this with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when God comes to save, that's when grace is irresistible. That's when the knock of the Holy Spirit on your heart is irresistible. Because it just as he knocks on the outside, he goes on the inside and opens it up. Right? When he comes to save, he saves. There's no failure. But how many times is a good word preached and no one hears? Right? The gospel is resisted. And this is when our, where an Arminian would say, would cavil and say, of course God's grace can be resisted. Yes, God's grace is resisted. Time and time again, we've all resisted it. But in this case, what we're saying is, when the Spirit comes to save, he's irresistible. He won't be turned away. He's coming to tackle. He's coming to take down. He's coming to take over. He's coming to, to spoil, right? To gather the spoils and to plunder, to drive out the strong man, because he is stronger than he, to drive him out and plunder that house and to take control. Furthermore, letter L, about the Holy Spirit and his ministry. Salvation is accomplished by the Spirit's effectually uniting sinners with Christ and therefore is both effectual and eternal. That's that same point, right? When the Spirit comes, he's effectual in doing so. He unites us to Christ. He marries us to the Lord Jesus. The scripture, Paul says, those who, who are in Christ become one spirit with the Lord. Amazing language. Don't even comprehend what that means. But it's surely a union brought, out, brought about by the Holy Spirit who unites us together. We are joined together in the one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And he unites us to Jesus, and therefore his work to save us is effectual and eternal. You can't lose your salvation because you can't be divorced from Christ because God hates divorce. I'll let you look at those texts. We're getting late. Okay, three more presuppositions. What about... Professions of faith, right? What about maybe false professions? Letter M, another presupposition. Though God's people can backslide grievously, a child of God cannot lose his salvation. 
but he will always be brought back for God's name's sake. Because those whom he called are predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. It's an unbreakable golden chain of salvation. You can't be united to, to Christ and then ripped away from Christ. Christ can't die for you, pay for your sins, and be a high priest for you in heaven and you perish forever in hell. It's just not happening, right? Because then Christ is at fault. Because for what sin did he not die? Unbelief? Backsliding? Right? He died for all our sins. Nothing can take us away from God. If salvation is sure, it is eternal. Turn to John 10 and be reminded of our Lord's strong language in John 10, verses 25 to 30. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. <clears throat> the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Notice the distinction made there. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. Think of that word know there. I love them. I know them. He's not talking intellectual. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That were enough. But then he goes on. My Father who has given them to me. Remember, they were yours first. My Father has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Right? I and the Father are one. See? So we can't be snatched from the work of the cross. And furthermore, we can't be snatched from the work of election. God elected us before any, other, before any opposition to our salvation existed. How can you be taken away from that? How can that be, you, you be robbed of that? That was done completely without you. You can't be robbed of that. And you can't be robbed of Christ dying for you and paying for your sins in full and saying, saying for your sake and with regard to you, it is finished. And rising from the dead for your justification, you can't lose that. So very important. We may fall grievously. Think of all the sins of God's people laid out in Scripture for us. But we will always be brought back. Sometimes at great cost, great pains, with great consequences. Right? We might limp, as it were, like Jacob for the rest of our lives because of our sins, our, our backslidings. But we will be brought back by God's grace. Letter N. If a person professes Christ and then returns to his old life, showing no fruit of Christ indwelling Holy Spirit, he's proven to have never been united to Christ. His profession was in word only and not in truth. And we've all seen that. We've all seen that. I've certainly seen that growing up. In my circles, right? How many people make a profession of faith and six months later they're right back where they were and they never come back again, right? An obvious turning back, returning, as Peter says, going back to, his, to the vomit, right? A dog going back to his vomit, a pig going back to the mire. Turn to Hebrews 6 as you're familiar with this passage. You should really read the whole passage, but Hebrews 6 Verses 4 to 6. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. He's not talking about genuine believers who have fallen away. He's talking about professors who have fallen away from their profession and proved to have never been redeemed. And notice he goes on in verse 9, Though we speak of this, yet in your case, beloved, we are sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Press on, right? Press on and take hold of the promises. All right, finally, kind of a summary, letter O. The free offer of the gospel, then, is to be sincerely offered in the name of God to all men indiscriminately. Confident in God's election, trusting in God's sovereignty, aware of man's inability and responsibility, believing in the Spirit's effectual work in the elect, and in full dependence upon the Word and Spirit as the appointed means of salvation. That's how we go forth. It's a free offer to the gospel. We preach it to everyone. We offer it to anyone and everyone indiscriminately. Right? It is a sincere offer of God. No picking and choosing. Everyone needs it. God knows his elect. All we know is all men are sinners. And there's an urgency, right, in evangelism. And there's a necessity in evangelism. Because they're going to die without Christ. And if they die without Christ, they will perish forever. There's only this life. And as much as we know, only today 
That's why the Bible never says you can wait until tomorrow to decide this matter. It always says today is a day of salvation. Today, today, today. Because that's all you know you have. This moment. right? And so I hope this will encourage us as we go forth and be reminded that the Lord is the one uh, who is the great evangelist. Remember, this is God's message. Not only as we read from Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, right? It's a message of reconciliation that we've received from God. But remember in Romans 3, as I mentioned this morning, it is God who put his son forth as a propitiation for our sins to be received by faith. It's God's gospel message. And it's God who tells his, who sent his prophets forth. It's God who raised up Moses, who raised up Samuel, who raised up Paul and Timothy and Titus, raised up the, chose the apostles and sent them forth. It's the Lord says that has said, go into all the world. It's Christ who gave the great commission. Yes, primarily to the apostles, uh, but through them to the church as a whole as well in its own measure that we might go forth, not in an apostolic sense, maybe not even in a ministerial sense. The majority of the church is not ministers. The majority of the church is members. But that's how the church actually evangelizes. We all go out and we bring the gospel. We share Jesus. We do as the woman at the well, right? Could he be the one, right? And we share Christ. All right, well, let me pray, and then we'll respond to God's goodness tonight with Psalm 67b. Father, we are so thankful for the gospel. We are thankful for the manner in which you have brought it unto us, indeed, in such an effectual and saving way. We rejoice that we have come to know Christ as Savior and Lord, and we thank you for our salvation. And we ask your forgiveness, Lord, where we have not properly... um, borne the burden and felt the need of the lost. Uh, Lord, where our hearts have been cold toward the lost, we we do pray for a greater burden toward the lost, perishing sinners that are around us all the time. We pray that you would bless this study and series on evangelism, that you would empower and strengthen and enable your church, this church, this congregation, Lord, to bear witness, each in his or her own way, in our own circles, whatever opportunities are afforded us not all, not all of us have the same opportunities but father we pray that what we have given to us we will be good stewards of and we will take advantage we pray that we would indeed uh, lord seize our friendships and relationships as opportunities to speak of christ and that we would not be ashamed of the gospel or ashamed of jesus but that we would be faithful to share christ and we pray lord we we pray that it would always be faithful and therefore successful But we do pray that you may be pleased to make us instruments in your hand for the conversion of sinners, especially the conversion of those whom we love that are yet lost. Go with us into this week, O God. Help us to walk in the ways of salvation and truth and faithfulness. Help us to be a repentant people, living out our resolve to turn from sin and to walk in the ways of righteousness. And we pray that you would strengthen your church, upholding us in our faith, and bring us together again. We ask it all for the sake of Jesus. Amen.